the British justice system is the envy of the world. But in the past, mistakes have been made. Over the last 150 years, approximately 1,500 people have been hanged in the United Kingdom. Many of those desperately protested their innocence. Some of these long-standing convictions could be a miscarriage of justice. The evidence is so overwhelming that they have to tell the truth. In this series, a living relative will attempt to clear their family name. It's a false equivalence. Having an affair is not the same as murder. Searching for new evidence. The toxicology evidence points to the fact that he took, at some stage, he took arsenic. With help from two of the UK's leading barristers, one for the defense. There is a world of difference between an unpleasant journey and murder. And one for the prosecution. He cut off her head, dismembered her, and buried her in a place where he hoped she would never be found. They're on a mission to solve a mystery, submitting their findings to a Crown Court judge. Your Honour ought to declare the conviction for murder to be unsafe. Thank you both for your submissions. I shall consider these matters for myself. Can this modern investigation rewrite history? the 11th of May, 1889, in Liverpool. Cotton broker James Maybrick passed away after a two-week battle with illness. A post-mortem revealed his body contained traces of arsenic. Suspicion quickly fell on his wife, Florence Maybrick, after servants saw her handling some of the deadly poison. Despite protesting her innocence, Florence was later charged with the murder of James Maybrick. On the 7th of August, 1889, after a week-long trial, Florence was found guilty and sentenced to death. However, Florence's story didn't end there. Today, Dave Maybrick, a relative of James and Florence, has been researching the case. It's kind of striking, you know. You hear these tales, don't you? to think that you might be connected directly to this sort of grisly story of murder. The story of the Maybrick's doomed marriage has been part of Dave's family for generations. Since I've been a kid, I have heard the story of Florence Maybrick. Every time I scratch the surface of this case, I'd find out a little more about her, about James, about the case. Dave strongly questions Florence's conviction. From what I understand, the evidence against Florence, the actual evidence for murder is very slim. My hope, my absolute hope, and my firm belief is that, that this will be seen as an injustice. The case against Florence was a controversial one, steeped in Victorian prejudice. But was it a miscarriage of justice? And can a modern-day legal team reach a different conclusion? Jeremy Dean QC has 30 years' experience as a barrister and will be leading the defense. Sasha Wasp QC is one of the country's most formidable prosecutors. However, in this investigation, if she finds evidence that undermines the conviction, she will raise it. Dave has come to London to meet with the barristers. Hello, Dave. Hello, nice Sasha. to meet you. Sasha, hi. You? Hi, nice to meet you, Dave. How Jeremy, you? nice to meet you. So, so tell us how you uh, developed an interest in Florence's case. The, the story of Florence has, has always been with me in a strange way. It's a story that's been handed down, if you like, from um, my aunts and uncles. What aspects of the case have you been able to look at? Florence, from minute one, is the only person in the frame for this. Mm. Crime. There's something else there. There's a story there that uh, involves her being an outsider, being a woman in Victorian times, being, you know, prejudiced against. I do think it would be nice if it went Florence's way. Mm. Yes. I think it, I don't think anyone's going to look at it again this closely. However, you know. Okay. Having said that, you don't know, do you? But I, it would be nice to, to sort of close the book on it for her, if you like. Well, Jeremy and I will look at this very closely and we will explore all of the avenues and hopefully we will have some news for you next time we meet.
Fingers crossed. All right. Okay. Very nice to see you. Florence Maybrick was born Florence Chandler in Mobile, Alabama in 1862. At the age of 18, whilst traveling to Britain via ocean liner, she met cotton broker James Maybrick, a man 23 years her senior, whom she later married. Outwardly, the Maybricks were a picture of happiness and upper-class success in Victorian Liverpool, with two children and several staff. But behind closed doors, James's business was failing, and the family were facing financial troubles, coupled with stories of extramarital affairs and physical abuse. When James Maybrick died due to apparent arsenic poisoning, his family immediately directed their accusations at his wife, Florence. But was Florence capable of murder? To begin their investigation, Sasha and Jeremy are examining the key facts of the case. Well, Jeremy, this is a case of alleged poisoning from 1889 concerning the defendant Florence Maybrick, who lived with her husband, James Maybrick, now, in April 1889, um, James was taken ill. He went to his bed, he complained of a stomach upset. Florence nursed him, but James's condition deteriorated. On the 11th of May 1889, he died. Two days later, a post-mortem was performed and traces of arsenic were found in his body. Florence Maybrick was arrested on the 14th of May, 1889, and charged with the murder of her husband. The trial began in Liverpool, and there were complex and often conflicting accounts from the medical experts who gave evidence. And at the end, the jury was sent out. They returned verdicts of guilty, and on Wednesday, the 7th of August, Florence was sentenced to death. So what do you make of all of this? Firstly, what did James Maybrick actually die of? I question whether it was ever established that he had been given a fatal dose of arsenic. Also, it's to be noted that in 1889 and thereabouts, arsenic was a common poison and used in common medicines. The question arises, could he have poisoned himself? Yes. So, this is a, a worrying case which throws up a large number of issues which you and I are going to have to look at very carefully indeed. Well, I entirely agree. To learn more about the events that led to the murder charge against Florence, Dave has come to the Maybrick's former residence. Caroline, hi. hi. Nice to meet Pleased you. Pleased to meet you. Um... Here he's meeting Caroline Crampton, who's done extensive research on the case. This is the place formerly known as Battle Creese House, where James and Florence Maybrick lived in 1889. And this is the actual place where James passed away, isn't it? This is where he died, yeah. This yeah. is where he had his last illness and where he died. On the 27th of April, 1889, James Maybrick became unwell and took to his bed. So here we are in what was James Maybrick's bedroom. His bed would have been here, right in the middle, and this is where you know, he lived and also where he died. Mm. He suffered a bit on and off with gastric trouble, but this time it was really serious. James was seen by doctors and prescribed a variety of medicines. Amongst those caring for James was his wife, Florence. Florence was quite used to looking after him when he wasn't well, and so she, to begin with, was in and out of his sick room, you know, bringing up food from the cook, you know, nice things to eat when you're ill, that kind of thing. <laughs> when James failed to show any signs of getting better, his brothers and some of the servants began to suspect that Florence may be poisoning him. So they banned her from the sick room, from this very room. They said, you can't go in, you're not to bring him food you're not to be involved with him at all. If it had been a cut and dried case of Florence was definitely poisoning him, removing her, he should have started to get better, right? But he didn't. On the 11th of May, 1889, after a few weeks of sickness, James Maybrick passed away. And Florence is sort of prostrated in the room next door. 
she passes out from the emotion and the stress of the last few days. You know, she's been kept away from her husband and now he's died. Uh, but still that suspicion is sort of mounting and attaching itself to her. The heavy suspicion from James's family towards Florence continued. And in the days following his death, Florence was placed under house arrest. It sounds like this has already got uh, a conclusion in the minds of everybody in the house apart from Florence. It does it, seem that way, yeah. yes, that the story already has an ending even before it's really happened. Florence maintained that she did not poison her husband. But what reasons could James's family have had to blame her for his murder? Sasha and Jeremy are examining the chronology of the events leading up to James Maybrick's death. James Maybrick was visited by doctors on a large number of occasions as represented by the red circles on this calendar for April and May 1889. Over that period of time, he was prescribed a huge amount of medicines, several of which contained arsenic and strychnine. So he was clearly exposed to arsenic over the passage of time preceding his death. Well, these dates circled in green plot in what Florence was up to during this period. Uh, she accepted that on the 23rd and the 29th of April, she bought fly paper, which contained arsenic. She soaked it in water in order to extract the arsenic, she says, in order to use the arsenic on her complexion. And then on the 9th of May, Florence um, accepted that she put some white powder into a bottle of meat juice, which was intended for her husband. But I don't see how that combination of events even begins to establish that Florence Maybrick killed James Maybrick. That, that's the difficulty. What it establishes is that Florence had access to arsenic, she bought um, arsenic, um, and she admitted putting a white powder into a bottle that was intended for her husband. This may not be sufficient circumstantial evidence, but it certainly is the building blocks of some circumstantial evidence. Well, I'm not convinced that the sequence of events you've referred to even begin to provide a platform for the proposition that Florence Maybrick administered a lethal dose of arsenic to James Maybrick. While externally, James and Florence Maybrick's marriage appeared to be a happy one, unseen by the public was their tumultuous relationship. James had been engaged in a 20-year affair during which he'd fathered five children. But Florence also had her secrets. Dave is meeting Dr. Lucy Williams at Chester Racecourse to find out more about their troubled marriage. Lucy, why are we here at the races? Coming to the races is about having fun. It is about letting off steam and socialising with your friends, but it's also about showing you can behave properly and putting on a bit of a show. And at one particular um, day at the races, when Florence and James are there, Florence lets that facade slip a little bit, and she's seen going around the races, having a good time with a man who isn't her husband. And this would have been shameful and very embarrassing, and it would have shattered the facade that they would actually be trying to keep up, that James would have been trying very hard to keep up. Absolutely. The man seen with Florence was one of James Maybrick's business associates, named Alfred Briley. And then after that point, more of their indiscretions and, and the kind of depth of their affair comes to light. So it's possible with hindsight to look at this inciting incident as the beginning of a chain reaction, which leads ultimately to Florence in the dark. This is the catalyst for what comes very shortly after. So we know that um, after the day at the races where, you know, um, James Maybrick keeps his cool and tries to kind of smooth everything over, the Maybricks go home and there's a really violent altercation between them. There's been domestic violence before in which James has kind of beaten Florence, but after this um, kind of moment at the racetrack, they go home, he's livid um, and she is sort of very severely abused. And following that, it's not very long until James starts getting sick. 
When James Maybrick began feeling unwell, he was taking a vast array of medicines and was known to boast to his friends about his self-medicating technique known as arsenic eating. Was Florence to blame for his sickness? Or could James's unorthodox attempts to cure himself have contributed to his continued ill health? Jeremy and Sasha are meeting with chemist Dr. Catherine Harkup for more information about James's prescribed drugs. What I want to begin by asking you is about the medication that James Maybrick was on. I, I think you've seen a list of I have medications. Seen a list. And it's a fairly extensive list. It is an astonishingly long list of medications. I mean, have yes. you, are you surprised that. I am surprised at the sheer quantity and variety of medicines that right. he was prescribed. There are many drugs listed. What percentage of those drugs would you say contain poisonous elements? Well, I would say that all bar maybe one or two of them would not be prescribed today. Right. Um, I would but why not? Because they simply either have no effect or they are harmful. And there is um, a good proportion of them, I would say maybe um, a good third to a half, that contain at least some potentially lethal toxins. The general expectation at the time was that medicine would make you feel unwell, it would taste bad, it mm -hmm. would be horrible, but it would help you in the end. And so when you felt a bit nauseous after taking medicine, that was to be expected. Mm -hmm. We know that arsenic was freely available in this era and had m multiple uses. Um, Florence Maybrick always claimed that she used arsenic as a face wash. What is the legitimacy of that? Certainly at the time, it was a well-known remedy right. for um, getting rid of spots and blemishes mm. on the face. And it would have been effective. So the arsenic would have destroyed the bugs and bacteria that would have caused those spots and right. blemishes. So it would have given you an excellent complexion. But the point is that it would be perfectly acceptable yes. for a woman to have access to arsenic and to use arsenic as part of her cosmetic routine. Arsenic soaps, arsenic face washes were advertised yes. openly and right. women were encouraged to buy them. So in this case, effectively, we have arsenic being used by Florence mm -hmm. for entirely legitimate purposes. For the time. We have arsenic being taken in worrying quantities by her husband and we have traces of arsenic being found in his body yes. on post-mortem, and that's really all, all it, there is to it. While James Maybrick lay ill in bed, Florence continued corresponding with Alfred Briley, with whom she'd been seen flirting at the racetrack. On the 8th of May, 1889, one of the servants intercepted a message Florence had written to Briley, which contained some potentially incriminating language. Dave is looking at how the wording of that letter was used against her. This is the point at which James is already ill and they are communicating in a coded way via letter. Since my return, I have been nursing M, which is the code that she uses or that they use for James. Since I, my return, I've been nursing M day and night. He is sick unto death. And this phrase, he's sick unto death, is taken as uh, I suppose in a threatening way, that that's her intention, that, the, that the, her nursing James and the fact that he is sick unto death, somehow it's connected and somehow it's a conspiracy. I cannot answer your letter fully today, my darling, but relieve your mind of all fear of discovery. This phrase, fear of discovery, was also used against her. Discovery of what? It throws up questions probably, in their mind, discovery of a relationship. But of course, fear of discovery could apply to a crime as well, if you were to look upon it with suspicious eyes. Again, these, these, these phrases were used against her at trial later on. The one may assume that's related to some sort of sinister murder plot. On the 11th of May, 1889, James Maybrick passed away. Three days later, Florence was placed under house arrest and eventually moved to jail. During that time, a post-mortem was conducted on James's body. Arsenic was found in his system, but did the levels constitute a fatal dose? 
to discover if there was any real proof that Florence had poisoned her husband, Sasha and Jeremy are meeting toxicologist Professor Athol Johnston. There was a post-mortem conducted on James Maybrick on the 13th of yes. May, 1889, and I think a, a small amount of arsenic was detected in a small amount of his liver. Yes, quite a tiny amount of arsenic. I think if you, if you work it out, it's about 20 milligrams. Um, lethal dose of arsenic was thought to be somewhere between 100 and 300 milligrams. Right. So he's got a trivial amount of, of arsenic in his liver and not a, a lethal amount. Right. Well, that's quite important, yeah. yeah. So are you able to express a view as to what you believe James Maybrick's cause of death was? Well, no, not from the... I thought the post-mortem was fairly um, non-specific as, as the cause of death. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the position in this case is that she was found guilty of his murder based on the alleged um, administration of arsenic. You, you, you don't believe, based on the post-mortem... The evidence is, is very, very weak that, that that was the case. There's nothing really to support that she was trying to kill him with arsenic. The toxicology evidence points to the fact that he took, at some stage, he took arsenic. But there's plenty of uh, evidence from witnesses that he took it himself, that they had self-administered arsenic. The amount of arsenic was found was, frankly, trivial. So I, I can't really see how that supported that, that Mrs Maybrick actually gave him a dose of arsenic in an attempt to kill him. Well, thank you so much. You've been extremely helpful and you've thrown real light on the circumstances of the toxicology evidence in this case, and we're grateful to you. Thank you. I feel quite angry, actually, because if, in fact, Florence Maybrick was convicted of poisoning James Maybrick by use of arsenic, when an esteemed expert such as Athol says there's no basis for that, then she might well have been wrongly convicted of a very serious crime she didn't commit. On the 21st of July, 1889, Florence Maybrick's trial began at St George's Hall in Liverpool. While facing the charge of murder, the revelation of her affair with Alfred Briley worked heavily against Florence in court. Could the expectations of a woman's place in Victorian society have caused the jury to discriminate against her? Dave has come to the very courtroom to find out more. It was Sir Charles Russell said, a grave statement, an extraordinary statement. The jury was not to allow any repugnance against a sin so abhorrent as that to lead them to the conclusion that she had committed the greater crime. So her defence barrister is, is acknowledging her infidelity, which was regarded as a heinous crime in, in Victorian society. And he's trying to counter what would come, which would be because she admitted or because she was guilty of adultery, she must therefore be a murderess. It's a false equivalence. It's a ridiculous false equivalence, obviously. Having an affair is not the same as murder. I don't think Florence had a hope in hell of being found not guilty of the crime of murder. At the conclusion of the trial, Judge Sir James Fitzjames Stephen summed up the case for two days. Could his lengthy directions have clouded the jury's deliberations? Jeremy and Sasha are analysing the wording in the summation. Sasha, in my view, it's remarkable that in a trial which only lasted seven days, the summing up itself took almost a third of that, two days, for the judge to sum the case up to the jury. And I would suggest that, overall, the summing up, which covers 90 pages of transcript, was nothing but unhelpful to the, to the jury, and it, and, it, and it worries me. Jeremy, I, I share your concerns. He refers to letters that Briarly has written her, and he says this, these are letters which are found in her room at Battle Creese House, and I confess that it is to me a most extraordinary thing that any woman having the least regard for her character and reputation should not have put those letters in the fire the moment she received them. Now, a proper direction would have said, of course, consider the affair because it may provide a motive, but do not allow your prejudice against a woman involved in an extramarital affair to cloud your view of her. 
And that error that he fell into is underlined when he came to deal with Florence Maybrick not being in a position to prove her innocence. Overall, I would suggest, in a case in which the evidence against Florence Maybrick was not strong by any means, the summing up is verbose, it's confusing, it's wrong in material respects, factually and legally. It contains too much comment, too much of the judge's own opinions. It renders Florence Maybrick's conviction unsafe. The jury were not properly assisted. That's my view so far as the summing up is concerned. Looking at the summing up, the judge made no secret of the fact that he disapproved of Florence. And all in all, I think the jury could have been left in no doubt whatsoever that the judge considered her to be a thoroughly unworthy woman. It took the jury only 38 minutes to deliver a verdict of guilty. Florence was then sentenced to death. Prior to her execution date, Florence was incarcerated at Walton Jail, now known as HMP Liverpool. Dave is here to meet prison manager John Woolham to find out how Florence would have spent her final days. So, John, this cell would have been similar to the one that Flory was kept in, or for the short time that she was here? Yeah, this is a, a, a typical cell, the prison of the time. She would have been in here on her own uh, for yeah. the, more or less the whole time that she was here, three weeks that she was here. Pretty much, that was it. She'll have been here all alone in the cell. And she would have known, really, that this was the only, the next time, really, that she was going to leave this cell was to go to, to the gallows. She would have sat here for three weeks, sort of contemplating that. But that's pretty much it. She'll have been just sat here waiting to die. Yeah, yeah. It's quite brutal when you think about it, isn't it? Really? Yeah, very much so. In a dramatic turn of events, just four days before Florence was due to be executed, and following a large public outcry, the Home Secretary commuted the charge of murder to one of attempted murder. Florence was reprieved and her life spared. However, she was far from being a free woman. Her punishment was altered to penal servitude for life, meaning Florence would serve the rest of her days behind bars. I don't know what's worse. We don't have the death penalty anymore, so it's difficult to consider whether that would have been a favorable option, whether that would have been, considering her complete turnaround in fortunes from high status to condemned prisoner, and then to have her sentence of death commuted to one of life in prison, I think she must have many times thought it might have been the better option to have died, to have been executed, and not to have to serve this open-ended, indefinite, hard labor. While Florence Maybrick served her prison sentence, external efforts persisted in a bid to prove her innocence. Jeremy has found some significant post-sentence evidence. Will this be the key to securing an unsafe conviction? Well, Sasha, we need to consider some further evidence which emerged in 1894, approximately five years after Florence Maybrick had been reprieved by the Home Secretary and her conviction reduced to attempted murder. Throughout that period, there were efforts to persuade the authorities that she shouldn't have been convicted of anything. And then in 1894, a package of evidence was collated and submitted to the Home Secretary, which, in my view, contained some very, very important material but um, nothing was done. Well, Jeremy, I, I've also been looking at this. In fact, part of this new bundle of evidence that you refer to includes Florence's mother, who said that indeed she did use arsenic as some sort of face wash, uh, and the mother also confirmed that there was a prescription that Florence used, one of the ingredients of which was arsenic. And Florence's pharmacist in Paris was to be able to confirm the ingredients that were required for this particular cosmetic. So all of that would have neutralised the evidence that was so prejudicial to Florence at her trial that this flypaper was somehow sinister and connected with the poisoning of her husband. I would suggest 
that bearing in mind all the circumstances and the whole of the evidence against Florence Maybrick, that the modern day Court of Appeal would not have substituted an alternative of attempted murder. And so she was wrongly convicted of murder. She was wrongly held liable for attempted murder. And I fear that in her case, she was victim of a gross miscarriage of justice. After serving over 14 years, Florence Maybrick was released from jail in 1904. She returned to her native America to lecture on prison reform while continuing to protest her innocence. In later life, she became reclusive and passed away alone on the 23rd of October, 1941, aged 79. To reflect on her case, Dave has come to the coast where Florence would have departed for home. In coming here, I was looking for a couple of different things, I suppose. I did want to know more about Florence, and I wondered if at any point I would stumble across some evidence that would point towards her guilt or incriminate her in some way, and there's nothing. There is absolutely nothing at all to, to, to give any clue or to give any sense that she actually was guilty of this. I think there's a tremendous miscarriage of justice has happened here. And I think Florence was just a... I think she was a very sweet young woman, and I find that I didn't think at the beginning of this I had any sentimental attachment about her at all, to be honest. Uh, but the more, the more I look and the more I hear her words and the more we hear about people who knew her and spoke to her, um, it's, it's awful. It's truly, truly awful. Such a, such a, a massive injustice. For me, there's no doubt in my mind, there's absolutely no doubt that Florence is innocent. And that her life was just destroyed by, by coming here, by meeting James. Sasha and Jeremy have completed their investigation and must now put their submissions before the judge. I'm feeling very confident that Judge Radford will rule in my favor because I simply don't see what the evidence was to um, convince Judge Radford to, to, to rule against me. I don't know what Sasha's gonna say. For Dave, today offers a chance to rewrite a story that's been in his family for generations. I think her life was completely destroyed. I think everything was taken away from her. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think, you know, there's a, there's a this, this is a small step towards giving something back, really. Dave, hi. Hi. Hi, hi Dave. Jeremy. Nice Good to see you. you again. Um, so it's judgment day today. Yes. How confident are you feeling? I would say I'm 95% confident that Good. this is going to go in the direction that uh, it should go for Florence. Good. What's the 5%? Well, it's just a kind of, because there is no 100%, is there? there's, no, there's no absolute. So there is always, I, I wonder if there's something that I don't know, that, yeah. I haven't, that I haven't sort of learned on the journey that's the smoking gun that I thought might appear or suspected right. might appear. I wonder right. if it has. And that's, that's right. the kind of slight doubt, I suppose. Yeah. Well, Jeremy and I have done a lot of work. We've spoken to experts. We've looked at the summing up. Um, and we will be making our submissions to the mm -hmm. judge. So if we go in now, I think the judge is ready for it. Excellent. Us. Sasha and Jeremy must now present their arguments to Judge David Radford. With over 14 years as a senior judge, he's tried some of the country's highest profile murder cases. But what will he make of this alleged poisoning? Please take a seat. Thank you. We are here today for me to consider, with the assistance of learned counsel, the safety of the conviction of Florence Maybrick for the offence of murder of her husband, James Maybrick, a conviction subsequently reduced to the alternative of one of attempted murder. Mr. Dean, would you like to start with yes, your submissions? Certainly. My first submission is that there was insufficient evidence to establish that Florence Maybrick administered arsenic to James Maybrick and that evidence subsequently emerged which reinforces that proposition and that the conviction for murder was unsafe and that 
the conviction for attempted murder, which was substituted, has been shown to be unsafe. Now, the modern-day expert contributions of Professor Athol Johnson, an extremely eminent modern-day toxicologist, and Dr. Catherine Harkup, a modern-day forensic expert of great repute. Athol Johnson essentially said that there was no case against Florence Maybrick for killing or attempting to kill James Maybrick, that the post-mortem was non-specific, and overall, Professor Athol Johnson questioned cause of death, let alone who caused death, and certainly fundamentally threw into doubt whether Florence Maybrick was culpable. And Dr. Harkab finally reinforced strongly Professor Johnson's opinion. She was appalled at the range of drugs um, James Maybrick was taking. She said that most of them are now prohibited. Many of them would have been harmful to him, that there was simply a lack of knowledge to that effect. Finally, we have studied the judges summing up in great detail. And it was far too long. It was confusing. It had little structure. And the jury would have had grave difficulty in identifying legal directions and understanding them, which may not have been such a bad thing because they were utterly confusing in any event. And so in all these circumstances, it's my submission that the conviction for attempted murder should be deemed unsafe. Ms. Floss. There were three pillars to the prosecution case against Florence. The first was that when the post-mortem on James Maybrick's body was conducted, 20 milligrams of arsenic was found in a part of his liver. And as Professor Athel Johnson was able to tell us, this was nowhere near a lethal dose. Secondly, the prosecution said that there was a quantity of medicine, some of which included poison, in and around the sick room of Mr. Maybrick himself. And the third pillar of the prosecution case was that Florence Maybrick admitted purchasing flypaper, flypaper, uh, the active ingredients of which was arsenic. And Florence's explanation uh, was that that was used for uh, cosmetic purposes for her complexion. Mr. Dean and I have had the opportunity of speaking to Dr. Catherine Harkup. She confirmed the use, popularity, and efficiency of arsenic for the complexion. And in the absence of any evidence that he actually died of arsenic poisoning, there cannot possibly be a safe case against Florence Maybrick. And I entirely support what Mr. Dean has said, that there was not a sufficiency of evidence in this case. And for that reason, I don't propose to go through any of the other grounds that Mr. Dean has um, addressed you on. Very well. I am grateful to you for making your submissions plain. I will reflect upon them. Will you be kind enough to leave me time to review the papers? Thank you. The legal arguments have now been presented to Judge Radford. But have the barristers done enough to question the original conviction? Well, Dave, you've heard um, what Jeremy and I had to say. How are you feeling about it? I'm sort of slightly elated because it went exactly as I, I thought it would and I thought it should, but part of me hoped, part of me didn't dare to hope that it would go this way. Well, Sasha has approached the case very fairly and the judge will undoubtedly take account of that standpoint. So the judge will be ready very soon, so let's go and find out what the answer is. Okay. Did Florence Maybrick attempt to poison her husband? Or was she really the victim of Victorian prejudice and baseless accusations? Judge Radford is now ready to deliver his verdict. It seems clear that after the deceased James Maybrick fell ill on the 27th of April, a suspicion as to the author of the cause of that illness fell upon his wife Florence Maybrick. With the assistance now of the toxicologist Athol Johnson, it can, in my view, be stated 
in more forthright terms. The quantity of arsenic found in the deceased body was clearly insufficient to have been the cause or indeed substantial cause of his death. Insofar too as suspicion was fomented uh, uh, due to Florence Maybrick's use of arsenic-laced flypapers soaked uh, to provide her, uh, she had said, with a helpful cosmetic solution. That explanation has been rendered even more credible still by the post-trial evidence showing both that that was a recognised course to take and that she uh, had uh, been taking it. I agree, lamentably, the trial judge failed to direct the jury on the burden and standard of proof and on the respective functions of judge and jury. The emotive and prejudicial approach adopted in key passages in the summing up to the unfair prejudice of the defendant cannot be excused on the same basis. Uh, that combined, in my judgment, with the omission of key legal directions leaves me uh, with the impression that after many hours of unhelpful recitation and one-sided comment, uh, that the jury's verdict was as unsafe as the true examination now of all the relevant material uncovered in this inquiry has now confirmed, both as to the lack of safety of the conviction for murder and of its substituted conviction uh, for attempted murder. Those are my conclusions. I shall rise. <laughs>